Good afternoon, friends. I'm the Reverend Dr. Mary Biedrin, and this is Wednesday Inspiration for Wednesday, November the 4th from North Congregational Church in Farmington Hills, Michigan. And I am Reverend Dr. Mary Biedrin, the senior minister of the church. I'm recording this on November the 3rd, which is, of course, Election Day. And so for today, for this time, and for the time that you're seeing it as well, I've chosen to wear my official garb. I've chosen to spend a day in prayer for our nation and our world, for people who are suffering from terrible divisions, for unity, and for uplift of people, even when they're not sure they want it. And so, as it turns out, the lesson that I had selected for today is very appropriate for that particular set of feelings that I think we're all going through, regardless of our preferred candidates, regardless of anything else. And so I would like to read to you now from Jonah chapter 3 and 4. Now, everybody knows Jonah. Everybody knows the story about Jonah was swallowed by a whale and burped out because he didn't want to go where God sent him. For us, as we're thinking about crisis and hope, though, the important part of Jonah is that, unlike many other prophets who said, I don't know, Lord, or yes, Lord, Jonah said a resounding no, Lord. He tried to run away. And during the course of this miracle of the saving of Nineveh, Jonah discovered something important about himself and about God's mercy. And so let's hear Jonah chapter 3 and 4. They're short. God spoke to Jonah a second time. Oh, and this is from the message translation. Up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh, preach to them. They're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. This time Jonah started off straight for Nineveh, obeying God's orders to the letter. Nineveh was a big city, very big. It took three days to walk across it. Jonah entered the city when one went one day's walk and preached. In 40 days, Nineveh will be smashed. People of Nineveh listened and trusted God. They proclaimed a citywide fast and dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Everyone did it, rich and poor, famous and obscure, leaders and followers. When the message reached the king of Nineveh, he got up off his throne, threw down his royal robes, dressed in burlap, and sat down in the dirt. Then he is issued a public proclamation throughout Nineveh, authorized by him and his leaders. Not one drop of water, not one bit of food for man, woman, or animal, including your herds or flocks. Dress them all, both people and animals, in burlap and send up a cry for help to God. Everyone must turn around, turn back from the evil life and the violent way that stains the hands. Who knows? Maybe God will turn around and change his mind about us, quit being angry with us, and let us live. God saw what they had done, that they had turned away from their evil lives. He did change his mind about them. What he said he would do to them, he did not do. Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God, God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. God said, what do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out of the city to the east and sat down in a sulk. He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. God arranged for a broad-leafed tree to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up. But then God sent a worm. By dawn of the next day, the worm had bored into the shade tree and it had withered away. The sun came up, and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head, and he started to faint. He prayed to die. I'm better off dead. Then God said to Jonah, What right do you have to be angry about this shade tree? Jonah said, Plenty of right. It's made me angry enough to die. God said, What's this? How is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree you did nothing to get. You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next. 
So why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh, from anger to pleasure? This big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong, to say nothing of all the innocent animals. And that is the end of the book of Jonah. And so it's kind of like a complete your own mystery. And we'll be thinking about that today. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. Well, now we've heard Jonah's story. And so I have a question for you as we think about this and think about what this story of a time of crisis can say to us, can give a message of hope to us. Are prophets like us or are they not? Are they completely different? We've heard stories of prophets who have said, here I am, God, like Samuel. We've heard prophets like Elijah, Elijah, who was unsure of what he was supposed to do, even after a big victory. And now, here is a prophet who said no to God and yelled at God and tried very hard not to take part in God's purposes. Now, it's easy to understand when you think about the fact that Nineveh was a city-state that was a sworn enemy of Israel. There were battles and skirmishes fought, claims of land. They were enemies. And it wasn't until centuries later <clears throat> that Jesus would remind his followers and us that we are to love our enemy and pray for those who persecute us. Now, that is not easy. It's not easy at all. Our own time, this time, this time around the election, this time around so many divisions, Lots of gaps have been opened up between people. Lots of people have said hard words. Lots of people have done hard things. And lots of people have really wished that they did not have to be all lumped together. <clears throat> but we are still called to be together by God. And we are called to see that we are all flawed. We are also all, every one of us, beloved by God. So Jonah runs away, but God will not be deceived and will not be denied. And so a storm comes up and it threatens the ship and it's tossing and turning in the water. And finally, Jonah says, it's because of me. And the ship's crew chucks him overboard. And for Jonah, it seems like all is lost. So he's been tossed off the ship to a certain death, except he's not. A fish comes along, a big fish, maybe not a whale, maybe a big, it doesn't matter. A large fish comes and swallows him and then burps him up on dry land saving his life. <clears throat> what an adventure. And this is a part of the story that everyone knows. Even people who don't know anything about the Bible have probably heard about Jonah and the whale. It is a demonstration that the God of nature and the God of all creation can, in fact, bend creation to do God's will. And what is that will of God? This is the important part. The will of God is not dominion. The will of God is not subjugation of people. The will of God is love. Love for the good ones and for the bad ones. Love for the city. Love for the reluctant prophet. Love for people no matter which candidate they support. Love for people no matter how well or how poorly they do in life. God has abundant love for all people. And that love exists before we were ever good. So Joseph gets up and goes to Nineveh a city that takes three days to walk across, but he only gives them one, one day, and he goes into the city, into part of the city, and says, you're going to be destroyed. Three days, you wait and see. You're going to be destroyed. Now, there's an interesting thing that happens here, because Jonah, I'm sure, expects to be laughed at. Jonah expects to be run out of town on a rail. Instead, the people of Nineveh, Nineveh listen to him, and they repent, and they turn toward God, and they ask God to spare them. Now, the truth, they're actually better than Jonah, aren't they? Even though they're the sworn enemies, they are listening to God more closely and more trustingly than Jonah himself did. That's an important thing for us to remember, that sometimes even when we think we know what it is God wants and we are God's dedicated people in a situation, God may have other plans, and there may be other ears more primed to hear what God is saying to us all than ours are. So Nineveh decides to do what God requires. And what is it that God requires? Do you remember? The next prophet in the Bible after Jonah says it, justice and mercy and walking humbly with God, not thinking too much of yourself, having grace and forgiveness for the people around you, 
and desiring justice, God's kind of justice, for all people. And so Nineveh goes into repentance, and God spares the city. And is Jonah happy? No, Jonah is not happy. Jonah is angry. Jonah is angry at God's mercy. Jonah is angry that the people were saved. It seems pretty surprising when you read it, when he says to God, I knew you were a God of mercy. I knew you were just going to go and forgive them. I was looking for destruction and you didn't do it. We get this way too. We don't want people to get forgiven. We want to be forgiven. We don't necessarily want other people to have the same privilege we do. We want to be saved and still be able to enjoy the deliciousness of triumphing over an adversary, the destruction of an enemy. It's a deep temptation for all human beings, and it's one that we've seen on display in so many ways in the past year or two. Are we allowed to gloat over the fate of others? Are we allowed by God to wish evil upon others of God's children, even when they're terrible? Should we celebrate not victory, but defeating one another? Should we keep the wedge deep in the things that divide us? You know the answer. We should not. But I know that I often find myself, like Jonah, sulking outside the gates. I want complete victory. Now, God also wants complete victory. But God's idea of complete victory is different from ours, and it takes a very different path. God's victory is to reach a point where people repent, where people look at themselves and say, I need to do what God wants, not what I want. A time when people are humble, when they say, this isn't all about me. A time when people work for restitution and for justice for all people. It is not telling God what to do that is being in line with God's will, whether you're a prophet or just an ordinary believer. Instead, it is turning ourselves into God's love light and letting it guide our path. That is really what it is to follow in God's holy ways. <clears throat> now, Jonah's story ends abruptly. It's one of, one of those finish-your-own-story books that the kids look at. What comes next? Did Jonah just storm off yelling at God after God said, you know, why wouldn't I want to save a whole city, all those people, all those animals, all those everything? It very possibly he could. He is given that freedom, as we all are. He is given the freedom to be angry at God. God does not destroy him. But I like to think that maybe Jonah, after hearing all of that, and after getting over himself, picked himself up and went into the city in order to celebrate them, in order to bring the word of God to Nineveh, words of restoration, words of reconciliation. That choice was his choice. He has that in his possible future. And we have that in our possible futures too. And I know which choice Jesus would have us make. So as you think on how the admonition to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you can shape you in this time after the election, we're going to hear Pat Butler playing a hymn, May the Mind of Christ My Savior on the North Congregational Church organ. And I'm gonna read you the words very briefly. Let me just get them up here on my phone. <clears throat> hear these words and then we'll hear the music. May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. By his love and power controlling all I do and say. May the word of God dwell richly in my heart from hour to hour so that all may see I triumph only through his power. May the peace of God my Father rule my life in everything, that I may be calm to comfort the sick and sorrowing. May the love of Jesus fill me as the waters fill the sea, him exalting, self-abasing. This is victory. May I run the race before me, strong and brave to face the foe, looking only unto Jesus as I onward go. May his beauty rest upon me as I seek the lost to win. And may they, for, may they forget the channel, seeing only him. Let us hear Patricia Butler playing May the Mind of Christ Our Savior.
Thank you, Pat, for that piece of music, a very calming presence in the times that we live in right now. And now we're going to pray. We're going to pray for our world. We're going to pray for our country, of course, for our communities, for our fellowship of North Congregational Church and other friend groups, and also for ourselves. And I'm going to begin with a portion of the prayer that Jonah prayed from the belly of the, the beast, from the bottom of the ocean, when he thought all was lost. And so let us pray, first along with Jonah and then together. In deep, deep trouble I prayed to God. He answered me. From the belly of the grave I cried, Help! You heard my cry. You threw me into ocean's depths, into a watery grave, with ocean waves, ocean breakers crashing over me. I said, I've been thrown away, thrown out, out of your sight. I'll never again lay eyes on your holy temple. Ocean gripped me by the throat. The ancient abyss grabbed me and held tight. My head was all tangled in seaweed at the bottom of the sea where the mountains take root. I went as far down as a body can go, and the gates were slamming shut behind me forever. Yet you pulled me up from the grave alive, O oh God, my God. When my life was slipping away, I remembered God, and my prayer got through to you, made it all the way to your holy temple. Those who worship hollow God, God frauds, walk away from their only true love. But I'm worshiping you, God, calling out in thanksgiving, and I'll do what I promised to do. Salvation belongs to God. O oh God, our God, salvation does belong to you. You have created the whole world and everything in it. It is through you that we live and move and have our being. And so forgive us, O oh God, when we mistake our own desires for yours, when we think we know better than to ask you, when we think that we understand the balanced scales of right and wrong perfectly. We are reminded right now in this time post-election of how uncertain our times and our lives can be. We don't know what the future will hold exactly. We are still waiting on many kinds of results. We are wondering how this will all play out. And yet, oh God, we do not need to wonder about you. And so we turn to you for strength and constancy. We turn to you as our God and pledge again to be your people, regardless of whether our candidate wins or loses, regardless of what is happening in the world, regardless of a pandemic, Regardless of natural disaster, regardless of all of these things, O oh God, we know that you are God and your steadfast love endures forever. We pray this day for our world, for all those places that I have named, the places of uncertainty because of political unrest, not only in this country, but in many other nations around the world. Now, we pray for the places of natural disaster, for places of fire in California and flood and hurricane, all along the Gulf of Mexico. We pray for those suffering from drought in Mexico and in Mexico and in Africa and in Asia. We pray for places in the world, everywhere in the world, where the pandemic is raging, where people are falling ill, testing positive, where people are afraid to stay inside and people are afraid to go outside. Oh God, you have called us to live a life of faith, not fear. And yet you have also called us to live with practicality in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. This is a difficult decision, God. It is hard for us to know when to speak and act up and when to settle in and, and wait. It is hard for us to know when we should be angry and when we should be forgiving. It is hard for us to know all of these things. We are as confused as Jonah was sitting beneath the tree that lived and then died. Oh God, remind us that you live forever, that your steadfast love never leaves us, that you direct us how to help in our world, how to care for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the homeless, the helpless, and the hopeless. Help us to be a word of calm and peace in the midst of a time of turmoil, but also help us to speak up for justice, for the things that you told us via Jesus were important for our world. Give us calm hearts and spirits, O God. Help us not to turn against our friends when they have chosen differently than we have chosen. Help us to open our hearts and minds to the possibilities that exist even when we don't know what's coming next. Help us to remember that with you there is always hope, and that hope does not disappoint us. And so, O oh God, we pray all these things and so many more. A prayer of thanksgiving for the lives that you have given us, for this world that we inhabit, for the beauty that surrounds us, for the people with whom we share this life, 
for those whom we remember with thanksgiving at the, after they have died from this life, for those we look forward to with anticipation as we think about generations to come. We know that we are safe in your hands, and we know all this because of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And so may you go forth into this day and all the days that are to come, remembering God's love, remembering God's faithfulness, remembering that anger in the face of the world events will not cure anything, that we are called to be people of peace, people of restoration, to practice grace and reconciliation and compassion in the way that we have been taught by God. And so may you go forth with the love of God, the peace of Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit abiding in you, flowing from you, and surrounding you this day and forevermore. Amen.